This whole lesson is going to be all about improper integrals. And uh, basically what's on the screen right here is a breakdown of everything about improper integrals. What improper integrals are is to kind of explain what they are. I'm going to explain them using the idea behind definite integrals and definite integrals were covered in Calc 1. So that's what this basically what I zoomed in right here shows. And it says definite integrals must have a finite domain of integration. So they go from A to B. Okay. So if you notice this example right here, it goes from zero to two. Okay. Um, this one goes from zero to three. So that's part of a definite integral that should be a review from again, what you learned in Calc one. And then it says it also um, must have a finite integrand. So this right here has to have, it has to be between negative infinity and infinity, meaning it doesn't actually go to infinity or negative infinity. And uh, same with this one right here. Okay. Now what that really means, it says finite integrand on negative infinity to infinity. One way of looking at it is there's no vertical asymptotes. Okay. If you notice for this first one here, it's just X squared. There's no vertical asymptotes. This one, there is a vertical asymptote at X equals negative one, but negative one is not between zero and three. So it doesn't actually matter for that definite integral. Okay. Again, that should all be a review. Definite integrals go from A to B. So it's finding the area from zero to two uh, between the X axis and this function right here, this expression, I should say. And there's no vertical asymptotes. Okay, that's the main thing that you have to understand with definite integrals. And what improper integrals do essentially is flip both of these things on their head. So here is some examples of improper integrals. If you notice this one right here, it goes to infinity. Okay, if you remember before, when we were talking about definite integrals, it has to be a finite domain. It's, it's going from some number A to some number B, zero to two, zero to three, one to three, one to five, two to six, it doesn't really matter. This one is actually going to infinity, okay, for one of the uh, limits of integration. So that's one way of looking at improper integrals is they have infinite limits of integration. So those numbers that usually go up by the integral sign, one of them will be infinity, or both of them could be, you know, one of them could be negative infinity, the other one could be positive infinity. Okay, so that's one way of looking at improper integrals. They're not actually improper, it's just how they name them. Okay, so infinite limits of integration, there's an infinity symbol up there. We're gonna do a couple of examples that illustrate this per this point right here. Like number one right, right here, it's the same one that I just had, zero to infinity. Number two though, it goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. So I'm basically gonna be showing you two examples during these notes today that show that, that infinite limit of integration. And the second thing is when there's an integral that's that has infinite discontinuity, meaning there's a vertical asymptote. So if you notice this one right here, at x equals one, so if I wrote x equals one in here, there's a vertical asymptote, okay? Because you're doing one divided by zero. Well, one is between zero and three. So the, the vertical asymptote is actually happening where you're integrating, okay? And again, that's the difference between definite integrals and improper integrals is one of them you can have an infinity in one of these values over here. And the other one is you're actually having the integral run through where there's a vertical asymptote. So it's basically the same thing you've been doing before, only this time it's just minor changes. And the two changes are there's an infinity and there's a vertical asymptote. The last concept that you have to understand is convergent and divergent. It is similar to what you've learned in like previous algebra classes, um, but you, you might have forgotten that because you might have seen it like years and years ago, just because it's usually covered in like advanced L or algebra two essentially. Um, but it says here, convergent, it says improper integrals ha has a finite value. So we're going to do improper integrals today. And if they actually come out to be some number, they're convergent. So if the answer is two or pi or negative three or any number, any finite value, it's convergent. But if the limit does not exist, say it just doesn't exist because you're dividing by a zero or you're going to positive or negative infinity, it doesn't, it doesn't go to some value. It's going to be just divergent because that limit does not exist essentially. I'm going to be showing you examples where it's convergent and divergent so you, so you can kind of understand what these two concepts mean. Okay. Now I just went over a lot of terms, a lot of concepts, and it's meant to just kind of introduce the concept of what improper integrals are. Okay. Again, it just has an infinity or it's, it's running through a vertical asymptote. Now what that looks like in practice is what we're going to go over right now. So this one right here, number one, it says e to the negative x um, we're doing the antiderivative of that, and then we're plugging in infinity and zero, and we're seeing, does this actually come out to be a value? And to kind of give this, this problem some context, I have put a graph down here that basically shows what we're essentially looking for. We're looking for the area 
from one to infinity. So we're finding all of this area right here, all of this part here. And then we're also finding all this area in between here. Now it looks like it just kind of like intersects at zero, but it's actually just getting forever closer to it, but it goes to infinity. It's just becoming thinner and thinner and thinner as you, uh, as your X increases that, that little thread basically right there of the graph. Um, <clears throat> so you're going to basically see, does this area go on forever? Is it an infinite area or does it actually stop and come up with some finite value, even though we're going to infinity and, uh, it's impossible to really guess this just by looking at it. Um, so the best way to do it is to do with the actual problem. So that's what we're going to do now. <clears throat> but does that make sense with the area that we're looking for with this improper integral? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And uh, besides just showing you that graph, I kind of do actually want to graph it out really quick too. Um, to kind of show you. So we have f of x is equal to e to the negative x. I'm going to blow this up here. Okay. And you can see it goes down. It's the same screenshot that I just showed you. And it looks like it intersects the x-axis. But if you zoom in here, you have to zoom in a lot, you'll see that it is still separated by a little bit. But if you notice, I zoomed in a ton, two times 10 to the negative fifth. So it's a very tiny value right there. Um, so much so that if I zoom out, it looks like it doesn't. But it never actually intersects that axis. But we're still trying to figure out that area all from here and then basically till forever. Okay, if it actually is possible, if it's an infinite area, then we would write divergent. But if it's an actual value, then we write the value in. So <clears throat> let's work this problem out. Let's see here. All right, first thing I'm gonna do is you have to do the antiderivative, okay? And then once you do the antiderivative, you are going to plug in infinity and you're gonna plug in zero. The problem is you can't plug in infinity. It's not a number that you would just plug in. It's not like it's not like some number. It's an idea of a number that's getting infinitesimally bigger over and over and over again. So it's never actually a value, so you cannot plug it in. So because of that, the first step to do these is to, to write them as limits. And because B is up here usually, in terms of integration, I'm gonna have B going to infinity with the limit, and then I'm gonna rewrite the integral so it's a zero to b of e to the negative x dx, okay? And again, that's just proper notation. You can't actually have an infinity in the integral sign, like the problem started, so you have to, you have to put limits in there, and we're basically gonna be using limit properties to figure out what that area is, if it exists at all, it might be infinity. Okay, so next thing we're gonna do is we're going to do the antiderivative. So I'm gonna rewrite this lim as b goes to infinity, but we're gonna do the antiderivative of this thing right here. Okay, and if you want, you can do integration by substitution. But since the inner derivative is linear, it's easiest just to do the antiderivative of e to the x, or I'm sorry, e to the negative x, and then divide by whatever the derivative is here. Okay, so it's negative one. So it's going to be e to the negative x divided by negative one. Okay, and we're going to plug in zero and b. Again, this should all be a review from Calc 1. So 0 to b. Okay. I'm going to simplify this by putting the negative up at the top here, just so it's negative e to the negative x. I don't want to have a fraction here. Okay, and then the next step for definite integrals is you would normally plug in whatever's here into x and then plug in the 0 in for x as well. So I'm going to do that next. We have the limit as b approaches infinity, and I'm going to plug in the b, so it's e to the negative b, and then you, you plug in the zero, so it's going to be subtracted by negative e to the zero power. Okay. okay. Well, the negative negative is a positive, and e to the zero is just going to be one. Okay. But we need to figure out what this limit is right here. The limit as b goes to infinity of negative e to the negative b. Well, if you plugged in negative infinity of this, actually, let me rewrite it first. This might make more sense if I rewrite it. If b going to infinity here, I'm going to rewrite this to be 1 over e to the b. Okay, and then there's still a plus 1 over here, so I'm going to put a plus 1 like so. Now, we have b right here, approaching infinity. So that means this is approaching infinity here. So we're doing one divided by e to the infinity. Okay, and it's negative. Um, the negative really doesn't matter so much, but since we're going one over infinity, the limit of that is zero. Okay, again, that's kind of a review from Calc 1, but it's gonna be zero plus one 
So the answer for this one should be one, which is really crazy if you think about it, because we're trying to figure out the area of something that goes to infinity. And though, even though it goes to infinity, it still ends up coming out to be a finite value, which is really kind of crazy to think about. So this highlighted part right here that I highlighted, if you went forever and never actually hits the, the uh, X axis there, it's an infinitely sized area, but it still caps out to just be one. Okay. We're going to go over into more detail later about why this is, because it is kind of weird to think about. We have a shape getting infinitely bigger, but it doesn't actually get any bigger with its area. Um, but it'll make more sense when we go over it later. Are there any questions on that first problem? No. All right. All right, let's do number two then. Okay, so this one is kind of interesting. It goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. So now if you look at this, this graph that I have right here, you can imagine, you know, coloring this area. Again, this isn't, this goes forever in both ways. It goes up for here. We're finding the area of all this part right here. And then it goes forever this way as well. And the question is, does this have a finite area? Is it going to be infinity? Even though the shape is getting infinitesimally bigger, is its area still getting bigger? And uh, we're going to hopefully answer that while doing this problem. All right. First thing that I'm going to do is I have to replace these infinities with limits, okay? Because you can't have an infinity or negative infinity in for this integral here. So I'm going to rewrite it to be the limit as, let's just say, A approaches uh, negative infinity. Uh, yeah, we can use A because it's on the bottom. And uh, hold on one second. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. All right. So the A as A goes to negative infinity, we're going to put an A here. And then rather than going to infinity, I'm just going to put a, uh, let's just go to zero here. All right. So basically we're only doing this part of it right here. We're going to negative infinity up to zero here. Okay, so it stops right there, okay? And we're gonna put in the one over, this will make more sense when we go through it, okay? And we're gonna add this, so there's enough room here, we're gonna add this to the limit as B goes to infinity of the integral from zero to B of one over one plus X squared DX. So basically the orange and the red step here, the orange is this part right here. So I color coded the limits to match the area of this graph over here, essentially. So we have the red and we have the orange. Okay. Well, the great thing about this is that the red and the orange are actually equal because of the symmetry that's in this shape. It's one over one plus X squared. When that X squared forces things to be symmetrical, in this case, it's symmetrical at X equals zero. So what I'm going to do is kind of take advantage of the fact that that's symmetrical and you don't have to do this, but it's kind of a little, it's not a shortcut because it mathematically makes sense. But what we're going to essentially do here is we're just going to take the orange and I'm going to multiply it by two. Okay. So the reason I'm multiplying it by two is because of that symmetry. The orange and the red are technically the same areas. So what I can do is just multiply the orange by two. That way I don't have to deal with anything negative. And we can just figure out this one limit instead of both of them. Okay. Again, perfectly legal to do, and we're just doing this because of the symmetry of that one over one plus x squared. Okay, so let's figure out this limit. First thing that we're gonna need to do, let me rewrite the LIM really quick, is we need to do the antiderivative of this one over one plus x squared. Okay, do you by chance know the antiderivative of that? It was covered in the... Uh, previous calc class. 2x? I'm not sure. Oh, um, no, it's actually arctangent of x. So that's the definition of arctan of x. Oh, okay. So we're going to do arctan of x or inverse tan of x, sometimes it's called. And we're doing that from zero to b. Okay, so we did the antiderivative zero and b. We're plugging those in and subtracting. So this is going to be equal to two times the limit as B approaches infinity of arctan of B, which is kind of a weird thing to think about. What's arctan of infinity, essentially? 
minus uh, arctan of zero, which is just going to be zero. It's going to be two times this whole thing right here. All right, well, arctan of infinity, if you use your calculator, you can find it that way. But uh, if you remember the unit circle, if you do, um, so say you had like y equals arctan of b, if you tan both sides, so do the tangent of both sides, you have tan y is equal to b. Now, if b is going to infinity, so we have tan y is, let's just say it's going to infinity. So if I put like an infinity in here, you have to think what would, what y value has the uh, inf infinite slope essentially um, on the unit circle, the change in y over change in x, the y over x on the unit circle. Well, you'd be looking for where it's one over zero, essentially. Okay, and the value for that is pi over two. Okay, so let me, let me draw a unit circle really quick to make sense of this. So say we have uh, a unit circle right here. Remember your trig. Um, right here, the tangent of pi over two is undefined. It's undefined. And the reason it's undefined is because you're technically taking the, the y, which is, is one, divided by the x, which is zero for that. One over zero is related to that infinity. It's approaching that infinity. So because of that, pi over two is actually what arctan of infinity is which is not exactly intuitive. So it's gonna be two times pi over two, because that's what this whole thing right here that I'm about to highlight equates to. So this actually ends up being pi over two. And if you want it, you can throw it in your calculator, get the same value. And then minus arctan of zero, well, arctan of zero is zero, so we're subtracting zero here. You, uh, the zero is obviously meaningless here, so you, mul you multiply this by two and you end up with pi for your final answer for that one. Okay, which is really weird to think about that if you add up the areas from negative infinity to infinity of this graph right here, you end up with pi. But if you actually do the math all out on it, even though it goes from negative infinity to positive infinity, the shape is getting infinitesimally bigger, you end up with pi. And this is part of the reason why pi has repeated decimals because it's actually going to infinity, it's constantly being calculated. So because of that, it's going to have infinitely many character or infinitely many decimal places after it. But uh, that's not important. The main thing is being able to do this, do problems like this. Um, yeah, just one question for the arctan. Uh, can you explain one more time how to do get it from B? Um, oh, how to get the arctan of infinity to be pi over two? Um, no. Um, how did you get one over one plus x to arctan? Oh, that's just you have to memorize. That's one of the derivative rules from Calc one that you had to memorize. Memorize, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it was it was part of a yeah, it's a part of a derivative formula. I'm probably not going to put those on an assessment though, because that is kind of like if people forget that, then it's kind of pointless. So I, I, I'm probably going to give more easier um, anti derivatives, maybe like number one. But I'm okay. not going to. I probably won't do any inverse trig. I just thought this was a cool looking graph, and it kind of shows the idea. But uh, if I give you a our, our, an inverse um, trig um, problem or something like that, just let me know, and I'll tell you the formula, so you don't have to. You know what I mean? If you can't find the antiderivative and just, you know, it, it's probably because I didn't, I didn't give you a good one to do. So if that ever happens, like if you were on a test and you're like, wait, what do I do? How do I do the antiderivative? Just tell me and I'll, and I'll tell you what the formula is. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. You just got to remind me and when in doubt ask and just be like, Hey, can you tell me, can you help me out? What's the antiderivative of this or whatever? And, uh, and I'll, and I'll help you. So, okay. but I will make sure I don't put it on a quiz cause it's kind of, it's kind of a tricky thing, but and this one right here is more of a standard type problem. Like you'd have to use U substitution on this, which was covered in the last section. Um, so this one, this one shouldn't be as difficult um, as that one with the arctan. This one won't be that bad either because it's just U substitution. So hopefully these will be, these will be more like how it's going to be on the test. So, um, all right. So we have this one right here, number three, it's two X over X squared minus four. You might be thinking big deal. Well, the main thing of it is the graph looks like this. And we're integrating it from zero to two. So if you notice, if we were going from zero to two here, this area, whoops, I colored too much of it in, hold on. The area from zero to two is gonna be this part right here. And then it forever goes down this way. 
but it's forever getting thinner and thinner. But we're trying to find that area right there from zero to two, essentially. Okay, so clearly it's going to be negative, but we need to figure out, does it go to negative infinity or is it negative one? Like what, what is the value for that little slice right there? That's essentially what we're finding in this. Okay, so let's start working it out here. Um, first thing that you need to notice here is that uh, you're going from zero to two. And if you plug in two at the bottom here, then you're going to end up with a zero because it's going to be two squared minus four is zero. So that means it's going to happen at a vertical asymptote. So you're not actually going to be able to throw a two in there, but you can get infinitesimally closer to two because that's essentially what we're doing over here. Okay, so we're going to be using a limit again to get infinitesimally closer to two. But if we plug in two, you would have an undefined. But you can plug in 1.99999 repeating, essentially. So we're going to be using limits on this, just like we use it on the other problems, to basically rewrite this integral to be the following. It's going to be the limit as b approaches two from the left, and the integral for it is going to go from zero to b. Okay, you cannot put two in there because, again, you'd be dividing by zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to get infinitesimally closer to two, like 1.999 repeating, because that's still legal to do. You're not dividing by zero if you do that. Okay. Um, so then I'm going to rewrite this really quick here. So it's going to be 2x divided by x squared minus 4. And then we got dx here. Okay. So now the next thing to do is just treat this like a normal problem that we've already seen in 4.1. We're going to do u substitution on this. So your u is going to be x squared minus 4. And your du is going to be equal to 2x dx, which is all right here. Okay, so that highlighted part is actually just equal to du, the highlighted orange part anyway. The highlighted yellow part is just going to be u. So I kind of color coded it there so you can see the substitution that we're going to use for it. So then this is going to end up being the limit as b approaches 2 from the left. And uh, it's going to be, what is it? 1 over u times, that's a weird looking u, hold on. 1 over u times du, okay? Because it's going to be 1 over that yellow times the orange highlighted part right there and end up with this. Um, <clears throat> and the issue with this is now we're going, where everything's in terms of u. So if you notice, we're in terms of x here. And then all of a sudden we're in terms of u. So what we need to do is actually change those boundaries from zero to B to be from, to be in terms of U, okay? When X is zero, if you put zero in here, your U is negative four. So I'm gonna put a negative four in here, okay? This one is still gonna be um, B, but B, if you actually plug in B to this U equation right here, B is approaching two, so two squared minus four there, that's gonna end up being zero. So this kind of changes our B right here. Instead of being two, it's gonna be zero. Um, and then you end up with a problem like this. Okay. The antiderivative of one over U is gonna be ln of U. So I'm gonna write ln of U here. And we're plugging in negative four and B. And B is approaching zero from the left. All right, so if you plug in B here, you're gonna end up with the limit as B approaches zero from the left of ln of B. Okay, so this whole thing here, minus the ln of the absolute value of negative four, which is just ln of four, because it's gonna be positive four there. Okay. Well, this one right here, if B goes to zero from the left side, that's actually going to negative infinity. So it's just gonna be getting smaller and smaller and smaller uh, as we go. So because of that, that's actually just gonna be negative infinity. And this one is gonna be minus ln of four, which there's not really much to do on that one, but infinity minus some constant, this is really just going to be meaningless because the negative infinity is so huge. So your final answer is going to be negative infinity, but negative infinity is not a finite value. It's an infinite value. It's infinitely negative. So when this happens, you would just write that the answer for this is it diverges. Okay. 
Do not write negative infinity. You have to write that it actually diverges, which means it doesn't even have an area because the area just gets infinitesimally bigger. In this case, infinitesimally bigger in the negative direction the entire time. Which kind of makes sense if you look at the graph because it's going down forever. So it looks like it's getting infinitesimally bigger going down the entire time. But if you notice, the other ones also looked like that as well. This one was getting smaller from the left and the right, and it still ended up with a finite value instead of infinity, where this one ended up with a negative infinity, even though it just trails off as well. So long story short is never go by just looking at the graph. You do have to calculate it all out to make sure that you have the answer. That's correct. So any questions on number three? Um, yeah, uh, for in the beginning, for B, uh, what, so you said two to the left, right? Yes, yeah, two from the left, yes. And why um, is that? Um, well, look, let's look at the area right here. Oops, sorry. I mean, if you look at the area right here, we're going from zero and then to the right. You can't actually plug in two because it's an asymptote there, but you can get closer to two. So that's essentially what it's doing right here. It's getting closer to two, but it's stopping right before it gets to it. So you have to kind of imagine that in your head. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's three and then four, the last one. Now this time it's going to be an asymptote in the middle of the problem. So if you notice, we're going from zero to three here. So we're going this whole, this whole domain right here, but now in the middle of it, there's just going to be an asymptote, okay? Now this shape is getting infinitesimally bigger, but it's also getting infinitesimally um, thinner at that x equals one, as you can see. So this one might actually have a finite area or it might not, we don't know. Okay, this is kind of where it gets a little tricky, but all these are pretty tricky, so. All right. So what we're gonna do is we are going to break this down into two shapes, just like we did before with the other one. And it's going to, kind of divide out right here at this x equals one, okay? We're gonna find this area here. And then we're gonna find this area over here, okay? Now it stops at three, but if you notice it goes up forever because of this asymptote. Okay, so this is gonna be, this will be really interesting. All right, so this is gonna be equal to the limit as B approaches one from the right. So again, we're just doing the red. So we're going zero to one here, but you can't actually plug in one because it's divided by zero. So we're gonna go from zero to B and B is approaching one. And we're going to put in the uh, one over X minus one to the two thirds power BX. Okay, so that's the red area right there. What I just wrote down in red is the red area. And then we're gonna add this to the orange area that I have down here. And it's gonna be the limit as A approaches one from the right. And we're going from A to three, okay? Of the function one over X minus one to the two thirds power, dx. Yep. So we have the red area, we have the orange area there. And uh, now we just have to figure out those areas and we can add them together. Now, before we were able to take advantage of the symmetry that the other problem had, the issue with this one is there is no symmetry because if you notice the zero to one is clearly smaller than the one to three. So you actually have to find each one of these individual limits here, which isn't that big of a deal, but a little bit of a headache. All right, so you could use u substitution if you wanted on this one, or the fact that the inner function right here is linear, you can kind of use a shortcut. So one way of looking at this is it's really just x minus one to the two thirds power. I'm sorry, to the negative two thirds power. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is just do chain rule backwards essentially on this one. So you're gonna end up with the limit as b approaches one from the left of so we're gonna do the antiderivative of this now. You have to add one to the power, so it's gonna be x minus one to the one third, and we're dividing it by one third, because that's reverse power rule. And then you're gonna divide by the inner derivative of the inner function here. In this case, it's x minus one, but the derivative of x minus one is one, so we don't really have to worry about dividing by one, because you're gonna have the same thing. So you end up with an antiderivative of that, and we're still integrating it from b Oh, I'm sorry, from zero to B, zero to B. 
Okay. And then we're going to add this to the same thing for the other one. Um, only we're doing A from the other side of one. And it's got the same antiderivative. So it's X minus one to the one third divided by one third. And this one's going from A to three. Okay. So the only thing left to do now is plug all of the values in. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, we're going to plug the B in first. Well, B is approaching one. So if you plug a one in here, you're going to get one minus one is zero over one third. So you're going to get zero. Minus, when you plug a zero in here, you're going to get negative one divided by one third is negative three. Okay, so that's the first part here. <clears throat> And then we're going to add this to the other side here. Um, you plug a three in here, you're going to end up with two to the one third over one third, which is the same thing as multiplying by three. So I'm just going to put times three. Minus, now you plug the one in, I'm sorry, the A in, which is really just approaching one. So it's one minus one, that's just going to be zero over one third is still zero. Okay, and the last step is just adding this all up. So we have negative, negative is a positive. So it's three plus three times two to the one third power minus zero. You don't really need to worry about the minus zero, obviously. And this ends up being your final answer. Which is really crazy to think about again, because that asymptote goes up forever. The shape is getting infinitesimally bigger and bigger and bigger, but it still has a finite area, which is again, really weird to think about, but it's true. So any questions on this one? No. Okay. Um, and we do have a little bit of time, so I kind of want to show you the graph of what this looks like on Desmos and try to actually like figure it out. So that's what I'm going to do now. So let's say that this is equal to uh, one over x. Oops. X minus one to two thirds power. Okay. And we're going from zero to three here. So you have to imagine the area from zero to three. Um, if I try to do the area from zero to three of f of x, I think I'm gonna get an error. Oh, no, it actually gives me a value, that's awesome. And if you compare this to the value we got, we got three plus three um, times two to the one third power. And you'll notice it matches the answer that we got, which is awesome. Um, but another thing you could have done too, if you wanted, is you could have done the area from zero to 0.999 repeating um, of f of x dx. You'll notice you get a value closer to three. It's, it's approaching three here. If I add more um, 0.9s here, it gets closer and closer to three. Eventually, if I overload the memory of Desmos, it becomes, oh, I thought I could overload it. Apparently, I can't. Um, but as you can see, it's getting closer and closer to three each time I get closer and closer to one. Okay, and if I did the same thing from the other side now, so like 1.001 to 3 of f of x, whoops, f of x dx, you end up with 3.765, blah, blah, blah. But again, if you keep getting closer and closer to that 1, it starts getting closer and closer to that 3 times 2 to the one third power. Okay, it's not exact, but if I just kept making it closer and closer, it would start to become exact. So that's essentially what we're doing. We're finding the area from zero to one, and we're really getting closer to one, and then from one to three. Okay. And they're basically all like that, essentially. Um, while we're here too, I kind of want to show you that first one we did. So f of x was equal to e to the negative x, and we were trying to find the integral from zero to infinity of f of x dx. Um, <clears throat> if you notice, if you put a one in here, it's just finding the area from zero to one. So it's like this, this area right here from zero to one. But what if I try to start going this to infinity? Some really interesting things happen. So if say I went to 10, okay, it's getting closer to one. If I go to 100, it actually rounds it to one. And if you remember, that's the value we got before. And we're not even at infinity yet. Excuse me, it already divided, or it already equated to zero. Really, this would be going forever. Looks like it runs into some errors here with the memory. But the answer is one, it's approaching one.